Hey everyone, in this video, we'll be talking about, you know, what is a species, the basic species concept, and how do species form, and how do we recognize them taxonomically? So let's do a screen share on our PowerPoint lecture. All right, to begin with, we talk about, you know, a species concept, you know, it, it is a construct. In other words, is how humans track life, you know, the individual's smallest component of a recognizable form of life would be known as a species. And uh, we have a species too, we're sapiens. So our genus is Homo and our species is sapiens, the bottom two ranks of that, the finest detail is the species. So let's figure out, you know, what these are and how they're recognized um, and find out, you know, if there's any validity in this, I believe that there is, but um, it's always open to change. You know, species can be a very fluid sort of concept. So let's begin. So. And there's a biological species concept, and this was put forward, you know, in the 1940s by a guy by the name of Ernest Mayer. And his, his, his name is, you know, historically significant, but don't worry about that for the purpose of this class. But, you know, what, what Mayer said, and as he was a biologist, he was working on real live populations. You know, that means things that are living, not things in the past, but you're dead. And there's a difference because in real time, you can see what animals are doing behavior-wise in their mating. Okay. So you can watch animals mate, you know, that was terrible. No, no, you can do that. You can watch animals mate or see the results of their mating. Now, if they mate and the results of that mating are to produce offspring, which are fertile, then you have members of the same species. The mating pair were a member of the same species because they produce something that's alive and can reproduce themselves. So that is a really good, I guess, you know, biological species concept. Right? Could a species be broader than that? Yeah, potentially, but humans have to define things. So we define that as a species, okay? Now, what a species is not is anytime we move away from the idea of the fertile offspring. Let's take an example of a horse and a donkey. A horse and a donkey can breed together, right? And they can reproduce, but what they reproduce is a mule. And a mule is not fertile, it's infertile. It cannot keep reproducing generation by generation. Thus, a donkey you know, and a horse are not in the same species, but they're close, right? They're close because they can still produce an offspring, though it's not fertile, but they have moved genetically enough away to where they are now separate species, okay? And, you know, the thing about it is you can recognize that we see the differences between, you know, a donkey you know, and a horse and something visually about it just says they're, they're not the same species. <clears throat> But for Ernest Mayer, that wasn't good enough uh, because, you know, humans, the human aesthetics to see hum uh, difference and sameness, you know, can vary, you know, and, and how we're, you know, culturally raised and how we see things. So he, you know, led this, led into the idea of reproductive, right? You know, the idea of reproduction that if you have, again, a fertile offspring, they're in the same species. Right. Now, also, too, when we're talking about the breeding of individuals, <clears throat> that the breeding should be done in natural populations. So, you know, things have to come together naturally, naturally, right? Not forced together under weird situations. And if that happens and you produce something fertile, that's an actual species. Now, what happens though, if things don't come together naturally, okay? What happens if you have to force them together, like in a zoo or under artificial situations, which are abnormal, very strange situations. Okay, if two things come together to breed, um, in situations which they normally would not be in, if there's some behavioral cultural differences and you push them together, you force them to breed and, and you do produce offspring and that offspring is fertile, are you still in the same species? No, you have a subspecies, okay, a subspecies. So if it's not in a natural population, you know, something has to be controlled, you know, or some unusual circumstance, you will end up, you know, having a fertile, you know, reproductive partnering, but it will be in a subspecies. Those are subspecies coming together. That's a very important definition. So now we know what a species is and a subspecies is by the biological species contact, concept. All right, but for us, that may be not very useful. And because we, we're exploring the past, you think about it. If I'm gonna go back and look, you know, earlier genuses of humans, like three to four million, even five million year points, um, can I watch them reproduce, see what the results were? How do I know if what they're reproducing is, is fertile or not? How do I know if I have a, you know, a true member of their species or a, or a mule, right? I, we don't know. And thus we're sort of guessing on similarities and differences between what we're seeing in the, in the fossil record, which is really limited. But really what we've got left, you know, are, are the bones and the teeth of individuals. We don't have the flesh. 
And that really does provide a lot of limited you know, visibility. So there is a lot of guesswork. You know, I mean, I would call it educated guesswork on trying to determine you know, similarities and differences, whether we have the same species or not. You know, when we're talking about looking at things visually to figure out are these things matched within the biological species context concept or not. Um, and that's a really woolly thing to do. And I think, you know, we've gotten it wrong uh, many times in the past because we've done this. Now, a better way of looking at this is to do what we call the ecological species context a concept. And I think this one is very good. And, and, and utilizing our visual eye between differences and similarities that we think are outside of the box on one side or the other and the ecological species concept together. I think we can try to really pen down our, if we've got something that's the same species or different species when we're looking at the, the, the fossilized record. And by ecological species, what I mean. Okay. What we do know, and what Darwin has said, is that usually we have one species per niche. That's it. And if you have more than one species per niche, they will come into conflict and they will battle it out over that niche. And over a very short period of time, you only have one species left. And interspecies competition will lend to the, the survivability of one species or the other. Okay. Thus, if we're looking in the fossil record and we find two organisms, which we don't know, or this, they look similar, but they might be different in the same species, if they're in the same niche, and that means the same temporal part of time, I mean, they're living together there, and they're not dividing up the niche between night and day or anything else. They're in the same niche. They're hunting in the day, they're hunting at night. They're utilizing the same foods, the same sort of territory, right? And if they're there for a prolonged period of time, like which would be visible in the fossil record, then you've got the same species because they could not be occupying the same niche. So even though there might be subtle differences in what you're looking at, that would be normal differences within a population. Absolutely normal differences within a population. So, you know, and when we see things that aren't too outside of the box, you know, and that are fitting within the same ecological niche, we again determine they could be the same actual species. So that's what we have to do, you know, when we're talking about an ancient populations where we have nothing left but bones and teeth. Of course, we would love to use the biological species concept, but that's just not going to happen, you know, because we're not dealing in real time. So our ecological species concept, again, live at the same period of time, live in the same geographical region, procure the same resources and exploit the same niches or niches. And that's why, remember the earlier part in the course in module two, when we talked about the, ge ge the geological sort of studies we did, and I said, context is king, it is. Because if we can determine what the environment was like and they were procuring you know, two different organisms out there that appear or maybe different or the same, and we can be, they're procuring the same resource because we know what the resources were. We know how they're exploiting the environment, each one of these forms. And if it's the same, then we've got the same species. And whatever we see variation-wise, we're, we're talking about normal variation within the species at that point, a species at that point, whether it's human or any other species that exists on Earth today. Okay. So subspecies, we've talked about subspecies. I opened that up when we talked about Ernest Mayer's definition and subspecies. Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> Is it trying to determine subspecies, you know, using the ecological species concept can be very difficult. Um, so, um, you know, subspecies are generally very close to the original species. Um, there's some behavioral differences, and usually there's some sort of a niche division, some sort of niche division, that they're subtly moving away from each other and take operating in a different niche. That means they could be feeding at night versus in the day. They could be choosing slightly different food products, you know. They could have a middle ground. They could be sharing certain foods in which they both eat, both subspecies, and the subtle differences on the edges as they begin to increase, becoming different species. But during the subspecies times, it can be very difficult to determine when we're utilizing the ecological species con con context or concept because there can be overlap. So we have to finally tune out what absolute small portions of a niche they might be dividing up. And if we can determine that, we might be able to determine that we have a subspecies. And again, these subspecies usually don't mate together, but if they do under unusual circumstances, we will get, you know, a form, the, the offspring, which is fertile. You know, we will get it. It will be fertile and we'll be able to reproduce. Now, the thing about it is this has actually happened in human evolution. And it's happened with our closest living relatives, there, which were now extinct, called the Neanderthal, Homo neanderthalensis, which I really pretty to not determine as a separate species because we have successfully hybridized uh, with the Neanderthal, which 
operate in a slightly different niche because of some unusual social contact positions and some things that have happened. We had sexual contact with them and produced, you know, hybrids, which were reproductively fertile because you and I share, you know, have between one and 3% of Neanderthal DNA within our own genome, which shows, speaks to that successful hybridization. So we'll be looking at those towards the end of the class, you know, as is, is, is the subspecies comes to play here and how subs, two subspecies can come together to produce something and as and, and is, is a su successful hybrid, all right? So I hope we have the species concept uh, from both the biological point of view and the ecological point of view and the subspecies, what a subspecies is from the biological concept and how we can try to tease it out to the ecological point of perspective if we can determine you know, at what part of the niche in which they're in, they own selective parts of it and beginning to shift apart. If we can tease that out, we can tease out that we actually have subspecies available. And that can be a very difficult thing to do, especially when we're looking at the remote uh, ancestral past, you know, of humans or, or any other creature. So as far as species, you know, what are, how many of them are there? Where are they? What do they do? How many, how are they divided? Well, you see, Right now, we probably have, you know, of all organisms on Earth, that's all organisms, not just animals, you know, but I mean, single cell stuff, somewhere around 8,700,000, right? About that. Now, estimates have gone up to 14,441,900, and some estimates bring it down to 8,700,000. Um, and the high degree portion was what we figured we haven't found yet. Of all the catalog, we're at 8,700,000 and, and growing. We are, we're, you know, we were, biological sciences is not something that's new. And many of the species that are living in remote places and they're also microscopic, things you can't see, and which sometimes we haphazardly find. And so their numbers are actually increasing. But what are the relative proportions? And what do we know, we know solidly about the division of things? Well, over there in the right hand box are our mammals, or the red box over on the side. That's us. Of all those 8 million, 8 to 14 million, us mammals are only 4,000 of that. So there are 4,000 mammals, and of course, we're just one of the 4,000 different mammals. Now, the thing about it is when you talk about the other species on Earth, um, normally the, the things which you uh, uh, list, and believe me, the average person can only list about 25 animals. Right? Of all the 8,700,000 species, the average person only lists about, about 25 because you know, we're so into our own culture. You know, things which we think were important to us. We shield our eyes against the rest of the world, which is highly diverse. So the things you learn in your childhood, like lions, tigers, bears, zebras, this and this and that, all the exotic things which take on these forms, which tend to be entertaining to you, are the things in which you remember, um, and close and some of the local animals within your environment. But believe me, that's just a small catalog selection of what we actually have on Earth. And if you were actually get out and start looking around, specifically to look at live, you'd be overwhelmed at the amount of diversity in which we have out there. Look, 751,000 know, species of insects, massive amount. In fact, they represent the largest right, clade of, of organisms on, on the Earth. Wow, look at that, 751,000. Um, compared to only 4,000 sort of mammals. So the, the vast majority of the diversity sits in the insects. And also one thing we can think about this too is how does this fit into a sort of an ecological perspective? Is it um, the things which are the largest in number are the things in which everything relies on. That's our food chain. So when we talk about really what drives our food chain, you know, we do have, you know, higher plants, which are huge amounts of number here, you know, 248,400. Of course, that really does drive the food chain, but also insects. In a number of things which feed upon insects. And it's not just animals, it's also things like, you know, microbes and fungi and all these things which are so important to our soil health and, and conditions in our health and our environment. Insects are, are the key things. And guess what's decreasing the fastest? The number of species due to extinction and global warming and human affairs are insects. They're, they're collapsing everywhere around us, which is a harbinger of a mass, mass extinction about to hit. So this is why ecologists, you know, really uh, biologists, we record these things and ecologists sort of look at sort of the shifting and changing in numbers is sort of harbingers to what our futures are going to look like. Unless we can shift global warming right now, and shift some of our usages on Earth, um, we're going to get up with a mass extinction. And not just insects are going to be declining rapidly. What will happen is, is the rest of the species, which we see, including mammals, and particularly ours, maybe even ourselves, will be declining very shortly. Uh, is this tightly integrated web of evolution, right? Competition um, has been set in motion perfectly. It's being destroyed quite perfectly by humans at this point. Okay. All right, so let's move on. I don't want to. Uh, be you know belabor this uh, on a negative thing i know it's awfully horrible to think about but let's think about all these things all these animals out here every single animal that has been discovered is classified okay 
and, and a degree of relatedness, how these things relate together. We have a system of classification, which I talked to you about earlier, right? And of course, this system of classification is called the taxonomy. So every animal on earth has a ta taxonomic relationship, right? Um, and as we begin, we start on the, the upper left-hand column here. These are the broad things in which this particular species, which is Homo sapiens us, you can see the species in the lower right hand, uh, are related to. So our domain, the type of cell we have, we're related to all eukaryota, all eukaryotes, right? So um, the unranked uh, unicopta is like, we're, we don't do photosynthesis of epithocota, we're the type of, of, of cells that kind of you know, live in colonies. We can become animals. We can become animals. And of course, we do, therefore, our kingdom as animals, well, animalia, right? You, metazoa, you know, we're compartmentalized. You know, we are, we have different organs in our body. Deuterosoma, we have different, you know, layers of compartmental in our digestive tract, you know, uh, and we're segmented. And we're segmented and held together by a primitive notochord, which has now been modified into the discs of your uh, vertebrae, between your vertebrae, the discs that are in there were once a solid piece of, of corda, cordata, right? A, a long longitudinal line of cartilage that's been truncated. And because you now have bony sections in between them to build your backbone, your vertebrata, look, we, we share that with all of the vertebrates out there, fish and everything. You know, infra, uh, infraphyla I means interesting, nestomata. So that means we have mouth. Nasta, nastomata, right? And now we're a particular type of nastomites. We are amnia, so that means our we feed our young, you know, through the amniota, amniotic sort of fluids. That's your amniotic fluid sac, which we actually share with reptiles. They're just in an egg, right? So now we're we're a particular class. We're mammals. We should know the the characteristics of mammals by now. You see, hopefully, your inner reptile. If not, watch it. I want you to know all the characteristics of a mammal. And you can see the bird type, particular types of mammals, their form. So, you know, we don't use eggs. And eutheria, the type of placenta that we have, we have a particular type of placenta, you know, full placenta on our body. So we're eutherian sort of animals. And we share that with all the eutherian animals out there you can think of. And that'd be the vast majority of mammals that, which you see on the planet right now. There are very few that are not eutherian. Some of these things like marsupials, maybe the duckbill platypus that are in that sort of league, but most of us are eutherians, right? Now, in that, in that we have magnal orders and super orders, right? We first really talk about advanced sort of features of our biology, which I don't want to go into. And nor do I, I want to expect you guys to remember all this stuff, but I want to show you how this thing works, the scientific classification works. It works on relatedness and refineness. As we work down the chart, we've got in more and more refined categories, you know, and eventually down to the species, which is just that unique thing. This is us. Okay. So you can see we're part of the primates. So you got our order is primates. We have we're a particular <clears throat> type of primate. We're haplorines, which tend to be the higher primates, anthropoids, like monkeys, you know, apes, and humans. Uh, we're a particular type of, uh, of, of, of at least monkey. We're caterize, caterinize, um, which means we're older monkeys. Our, our, our stock and our development began in Africa. And, and therefore, we became you know, apes in Africa and we become hominoidea. That's our super family. And our family hominidae really talks about uh, the types of apes we are. We're, we're great apes. Our subfamily hominidae, which is sort of interesting, uh, means we're more, far more related to great apes such as chimpanzees and gorillas. And then as we split off from those groups where we develop our own unique tribe, which is hominini, which is often referred to as hominins, hominins. Yeah. And our subtribe is hominine. Hominine, we're a particular type of hominin. Um, we are uh, walking, uh, hunting hominins, our subtribe hominine. And then finally, our genus, which we, we're a particular type of hominine. We're a genus homo. There have been other types of hominins out there, which we'll look at those particular genuses, such as Sahelanthropus and Australopithecus later on in their class. But our genus is homo. And finally, our species, right? Our species is sapiens. So notice something about all this complication, which you're seeing here. Um, what stands out, but what stands out to me is sapiens, species, because it's spelled in lower case. It's the only thing up there. Our domain is capital letters, right? Our kingdom is capital letters. Our phylum is capital letters. Our class is capital letters. Mammalia, with a big M, capital M. Species, always lower case. Because a lot of times, that's what we're interested in. Species is very important because when we're talking about animals, we're really talking about the species. So when we're seeing scientific reports, we want to look at where the species is that people are talking about. So we just look for the lower case, and that's why it's done that way. Now, notice something about our species. It's not sapien. It's sapiens. 
So people say, I'm a homo sapien. I go, no, you're not. You're a very new, new species if you are. So remember that, that your species is sapiens. It's the plural, sapiens, sapiens. Because it's Latin, it doesn't mean it's pluralized in Latin. See, it's only pluralized in English. In English. Adding an S to a Latin, Latin word does not make it a plural. Okay, so that's still a noun, sapiens, a, a particular type of, of, of genus homo. All right, so that's our cla scientific classification. That's our full scientific classification. Right? Now, uh, normally what we do is we don't use the full classification, you know, because there's many subcategories in there, which is, aren't sort of useful to trying to understand, you know, human evolution. But this is sort of a medium, you know, a medium sort of density taxonomy, which is most common, which includes the domain, kingdom, phylum, subphylum, class, subclass, infraclass, or order, our suborder, parv order, superfamily, family, subfamily, tribe, genus, and species. Now, I put a couple of designations here, little, uh, little lines about what these actually mean. Now, what I do want you guys to know in, in this course, you know, our, 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 our taxonomy, you know, what do these groups mean? You know, what is a eukarya? What is an animal? And what is a chordate? What is a vertebrate? What is a mammal? What does it mean to be theory and a theory? What is a primate? What are the characteristics of a primate? You know, first division, what is a haplorine compared to a cataract? Now, our superfamily, hominoidae, when did this happen? What does that mean? Family, how is our family established? What are the members of our family living today? Our subfamily, what do we mean by a split into a subfamily? Where were we in them? When did that happen? And finally, the arrival of our own unique tribe. Who's that represented by? What were their characteristics? And our genus, why is our genus unique? And what are the characteristics of our genus and finally our species? So when we're talking about anthropology, we're talking about knowing those basic transitions. And by utilizing a chart about this level of complexity will give us a very good idea versus, you know, uh, having to go and utilize the full super, this full, full classification, which many of the subtleties, especially in the unranked areas, aren't going to be quite as compelling for us to understand anything. Probably a waste of mental horsepower in our time, but this will be super productive for us. Now, in this section, this part of the course, we'll be learning about this because we'll be tackling, you know, what are mammals more specifically. Um, and we'll be learning from that all the way on through what our species is towards the end of the course. So you'll get a lot of preparation on that just by osmosis by looking at the material. Okay, so you don't have to stare at this for very long to try to memorize this stuff. It'll come to you. It'll come to you slowly, you know, over the period of the next couple of weeks. All right. All right. So back to species. You know, how do they form? Well, we looked at stabilizing, we looked at the forces of evolution before this, this lecture, right? And we realized that there's only directional selection, stabilizing selection, and destabilizing selection, right? Things that knock things off, stabilizing. Something will go for a direction for a while, it'll stabilize, and then something will knock it off into one direction or another, or both directions, two different directions. When we get knocked off into two different directions, we have a speciation event. And that's just known as cladogenesis. So you can see here in the diagram down by here, we have cladogenesis. So something destabilized a population and it went in two different directions, right? And it could be one trait, it could be multiple traits together, it could be a whole host of things that are happening. And there could be a lot of reasons for that happening. It could be, you know, geographical uh, separation. All of a sudden, some earthquake came along and our river came through a population and separated them, right? Some change in like organism losing hair, like the reason that our, our, our lice have actually differentiated the different species, their head lice and, and our pubic lice, right? Because of a geographical barrier decreasing relatively rapidly. It can be anything. But when it does happen, it's destabilized in the two different directions and we have a cladogenic event. Species A will become species A and species B. Another way in which species can form and change over time is just one species turning into the next. We don't, we don't have anything that destabilizes in two different directions. Whatever stabilizing and destabilizing is always going into one direction. Everything is going in that direction. So we've got a lot of gene flow within the population that stays together and all the new frequency, all the new alleles are coming in together and going, the old alleles are going out together. So our species will change all at once. One species will constantly be changing, will become a different species over time. And that process is known as anagenesis. Now, oh, anagenesis, okay? So only two things can happen. Anagenesis, one species, the whole species turns to the next, or we have a splitting event called cladogenesis. We gotta think about which happens more often. Well, here they, they usually both happen together. You know, you're always gonna be changing. Species will always be changing together. And then at some point it may split. And those two sides might begin to change by anagenesis too, and then they may be a split. And they can be changing by genesis again and then they split. So they both, you know, uh, happen you know, together. They're both always under operation. 
But which happens more frequently? Well, when you look at the, the variety of life, right now I'm here with like 800, 8,700,000 species. And how many you know, varieties of life did were there on Earth to begin with? One, right? So if that one variety of life just changed by anagenesis, anagenesis the whole time, how many species would be on Earth right now? One. We don't see that. We see an entirely bushy clay band of cladogenesis happening. So cladogenesis is the rule that we get more splitting in species because it really breaks up niches and it diversifies life everywhere to prevent the extinction of life. So cladogenesis is the rule. So anagenesis followed by a lot of cladogenesis, little anagenesis followed by a lot of cladogenesis, right? Which is why when you look at trees, you see like one common branch, the thick branch, which is the anagenic branch. And you see lots of fine branches that move out, lots, many, many members of those which represent the clades, the cladogenesis. So I hopefully that tree model is a metaphor for what's happening here, you know, represents the, why the vast majority of things that we see are cladogenic events versus anagenic events, but they both, uh, happen together because if you're going to have all those multiple branches on the leaves, you still have to have a common stock that has changed and has grown. All right. So, species two, what do we think about how they change? Well, you know, they can go by anagenesis or cladogenesis, but is it smooth or steady? I mean, that, that's smooth or is it interrupted? What, how, what, what do we see? We'll see both. Okay. Darwin thought that all species change, you know, gradually, all sort of at you know, the same rate. It was always gradual. Maybe species could change at different rates, but whatever rate it was, it was steady steady. Now, the thing is that that's not always true, uh, that sometimes evolution will happen very quickly within a species and it will level off, you know, and then it will jump up again and will level off. It depends on changes in the environment. If the environment holds steady, even random changes in the population will not be positive for the species usually. It may have reached its state of genetic art for the place in which it lives, like sharks. Sharks relatively make any successful genetic changes. So you don't see them evolve very much. They pretty much have flat line. There hasn't been a big change in the oceans or oceanic life for them to need a big shift to cause any complicated changes which allow them or, or need complicated changes in them, right? So variation you know, is not productive. And since it's not productive, it's always the one of the stabilizing selection right in the middle, the one that always survives. And any risks or the variation on the outside is not productive and gets eliminated. Those new alleles coming in the population you know, are removed and we end up with just flat line. Well, all of a sudden, something will happen. A new species will come in, competition for the niche or the niche will change. And there can be changes in all sorts of things, the biotics, the, micro, the flora, the microflora, environment can change to where as that species stabilized, so the variation within stabilization might be more productive versus the mean, and then it will take off into a different direction, and then we'll get a rapid increase. A rapid increase is called punctuated, okay? So punctuated means it'll be punctuated quickly because we moved off stabilizing selection, right? It's not the mean that's favored, it's off to the edges. It will adapt rapidly, and once it does and stabilizes, that thing goes off the edge now becomes the mean. Fully stabilized, that's the mean now, it levels off again. We have gradual, we'll be a little gradual, we'll never completely flat now, but a little gradual until something comes in the environment again, knocks it off its mean, then the outside, wherever we have in the, in the equilibrium, either it's this side or this side, becomes the favorite um, alleles in the population. Those will take off and cause another punctuation, another punctuation. So we see this often, you know, not only in genes, but also in the fossil record. You know, Darwin, if he would have used his eyes a little bit better, he would have seen this better within the fossil record. But then again, you know, Darwin didn't have a huge exposure to fossils. And mostly what he was seeing was in the context of South America, whereas if he had spent more of his life observing these things, he would have seen the subtle nuances in it. All right, so, um, you know, once um, a, a creature is set off, something big, you know, and the environment has changed, and the middle line is lost, right? The stabilized selection is lost. It either goes one direction or the other. You know, either it's going to go to anagenesis, everything goes, it begins to make a shift, or if it does a cladogenesis, because both sides of the stabilizing are used to go off all like this, we're going to get an adaptive radiation. Okay. So it means they're going to be proliferating into different forms. And we have a new niche, new niche that's opening up. And there could be multiple different niches opening up. So if there's a big shift in the environment, all sorts of new niches are available. You know, we're going to get stabilizing selection, you know, destabilized in many different directions. It doesn't have to go one way or the other. It can go in so many different directions that we end up with called an adaptive radiation. You know, lots of new niches opening up. So everything begins to, species begins to change absolutely rapidly, you know, radiating out into all these different fine niches which are out there. 
and that can cause speciation, rapid speciation to a lot of new forms. But we're going to see this really on a primate evolution. The, the primate was a hit. The, the variety of plants which were evolving, the different sorts of fruits, different sort of insects, all this stuff that was happening at the beginning of the Cenozoic led to so much of diverse ecosystem that from a, a few simple forms of primates began to radiate and diversify very rapidly into an adaptive radiation. And that adaptive radiation as it began to split, of course, is called the process of cladogenesis. All right, so that's as much as I wanted to say here to give you some basic terminology that we're gonna be utilizing for the rest of the course. All right, so I'm gonna stop my share here and the lecture.